Welcome, my name is Steve Podracic. I'm the CEO of Seattle Avionics, and I'm here to tell you about what's new in FlyQ EFB version 1.5. This is a major update. I'll tell you more details about each of these in a moment, but let me just give you the overview. Essentially, we put a lot of work into supporting many new ADSB receivers. Uh, we've added something called personal waypoints, which you may think of as user-defined waypoints, improved the flight planning aspects of the product in many ways, added the ability to download data from outside the United States, increased the accuracy of some of our data, and we have a brand new pilot's guide, which is a printable document that tells you everything you need to know about the product. So let's go into some of the details. Probably the single biggest thing in this product is the, re the introduction of support for many different new ADSB receivers. In FlyQ EFB 1.5, we add support for the Stratus and Stratus 2 ADSB receivers from Apario. We add support for the Free Flight Ranger uh, certified ADSB systems. These are installed certified systems with ADSB in and out. We add support for the Navwork series of receivers, which some are panels mounted, some are certified, some are non certified, some are even portable. To me, the interesting thing here is that we now support a wide range of different ADSB receivers, everything from inexpensive portable devices to certified ADSB systems that work with both ADSB in and ADSB out. In other words, with systems that actually meet the FA's 2020 mandate. The best part, I think, about FlyQ EFB, though, is that you're never locked into any one receiver. If a new receiver comes along, and new ones come online all the time, it means that FlyQ EFB will be able to use those. Keep in mind, too, of course, that this new support for these new receivers has added to fantastic support we already had. We now support about 13 to 15 different ADSB receivers, including ones from Clarity, the DualX GPS-170, the iLevel, and the Pathfinder, in addition to the Stratus, the free flight and the Navwork systems. It's unusual to mention bug fixes as a second major feature, but I'm going to do that in this case, and I'll tell you why. FlyQ EFB has historically had an extremely low ratio of crashes. We watch that very carefully. But we think there's always room for improvement, and we never settle for second best. That's why, in this release, we had 10 times more beta testers than we've used in any previous release. Not only were there many people, we spent more than a month in beta testing with something like 15 different releases to these testers to make sure that we got out all the bugs. In fact, we fixed all the top crashing bugs from the previous releases of the product. We fixed many bugs that weren't even crashing, but were annoyances, and we should have fixed them. And in particular, we also fixed many bugs that were subtle bugs uh, in flight planning and in filing the flight planning forms. Personal waypoints. This is a very commonly requested feature. You may know this as a user-defined waypoint. What we did here is we added the ability to take a latitude longitude and name it something that you can use as your own private little waypoint. You can fly to it, you can use it in a flight plan, you can search for it, and so on. This is displayed on the map in two different ways. In one way that's on the screen now, you have what we call the ident of the waypoint and then a text name, essentially a description that you can put down below it. In very crowded areas, that may be slightly problematic, so we added a second display format that takes away the idents and simply shows you flag icons, telling you where the locations are. These waypoints, by the way, are automatically synchronized between all the iPads that you may have, so even if you have multiple of them, defining a personal waypoint on one magically appears on your other ones. The way that you create these is as so. As so. Basically, you simply double tap on a point, care of double tapped on that point around the blue circle in the screen. FlyQ EFB pulls up a dialog box that shows me the latitude longitude of the point that I clicked on. On that screen, there's a new button that says plus WPT that I just circled. Tap the plus WPT, that is add waypoint button, and the system asks you what you'd like to use as an ident for it and what you'd like to use as a name. Now, an ident is similar to an ident that you'd see for a nav aid or a fix. You can't have spaces, you can't have unusual characters, just keep it to basic letters and numbers. It has to be at least two characters and no more than ten. The name, on the other hand, is what some people may call a friendly name, which is to say, you can type almost anything you want to, so you can have more descriptive text. You don't need to have that. If you do fill in that field, it gets displayed on the screen. So, this one I'm calling Cabin, and when I hit the Save button, you see it appear on the screen just like that. If I want to change that to the flag format, the way that I would do that is I go to my settings screen 
and I click on, or rather I change the toggle switch for show personal waypoint idents and it would move to the flag icon. By the way, the same feature is available by tapping on the position gauge, which is a latitude longitude gauge, which is one of the gauges that you could put on the bottom of your screen. And through the, in the flight planning section just below here, there's an entry that says personal waypoints. Tap on that and you can edit, modify, or delete any of the waypoints that you create. People have asked for a number of improvements to flight planning and we're listening. One of the biggest complaints was that you couldn't rename a flight plan or that changing the takeoff time was confusing, changing the pilot, and so on. So now we've made it very, very simple. If it said blue stuff on the top of the screen, blue means editable. So if you want to change the name of the flight plan, just tap here. If you want to change the takeoff time, tap here. If you want to change the pilot, here. Change from VFR to say IFR flight rules, change, tap here. And if you want to change the aircraft that you're flying, tap there. It's really that simple. Many pilots tell us that they like to fly outside the United States. Therefore, we've added quite a bit more coverage to our maps. In particular, if you look at the data, the chart data manager screen here, you see that there's a number of outlines covering Mexico, the Caribbean, Canada, and so on. Let me turn those green for you. As you can see, we've essentially doubled the uh, square footage that we now cover with maps. So we now have maps from southern Canada, we have maps from Mexico, from the Caribbean, from the Gulf of Mexico, and so on. I do have to point out, by the way, one thing. While we do have the map coverage for these areas, we don't have approach plates or airport diagrams, so it is still a bit limited. On the positive side, this new coverage area comes at no additional cost to you. There's no charge for getting the southern Canadian data. Many customers have told us that they'd like the ability to enter latitude longitude a little bit easier. We introduced that in the previous version of the product, but now we've made it a bit simpler. We have different formats that we accept now. So you can type in the latitude and longitude either as a latitude and then a longitude, or as a longitude and a latitude. You can use decimal entry, you can use hours, minutes, seconds, you can use a couple of other different formats that's described in the, in the uh, pilot's guide. So as an example, I've typed in this latitude longitude. When I hit the search box, it tells me what that is, which is a decimal latitude longitude, when it's displayed as hours, minutes, seconds. So it looks like it's 47 degrees north by 30 minutes, by 122 degrees west, 15 minutes. Now, just so that this is easier to see on the screen and to show you another feature in the product, you can also hit the new plus waypoint button here and turn that into a named point. I'm going to call this one I am here. And now you see it on the screen. As I said, we accept a couple of different formats. So here I'm doing the data entry in longitude then latitude format and I'm using hours, minutes, seconds. Nonetheless, it's the same point on the map. IFR pilots have special needs and a lot of them have told us that they like to be able to enter something, uh, enter latitude, longitude as a relative point to a nav aid. So now we have you covered. So in this particular case, what we are showing is that from relative to the Seattle VOR, if you take the 104 radial and you go 24 nautical miles, you end up at a point which is very near something already on the map called hump. Here's the point. I'm going to add this as a user defined waypoint just so you can see it on the screen. And since we're near hump, I'm going to call this point dump. And now you can see dump is right next to hump on the map. Similarly, folks tell us that they need to be able to compute the intersection of two different radials. We have you covered here too. So let's take this example. Here, we're beginning at the SEA, the Seattle VOR. We're traveling on the 121 radial, and we want to know the intersection of that radial compared to the TCM VOR, taking the 74 radial, as you can probably see on the map, that's near a, a waypoint which is called Mount, therefore I'm going to name it MTN, and now you see MTN right above Mount. It's that easy to do, entering latitude, longitude, or relative distance and bearings, or even the intersection of two different radials. Accuracy is paramount in flying, no question about that. In the previous version of the product, some of the data that we used for a train wasn't as accurate as it may have been. We went back and spent a lot of time, a lot of effort, triple checking the data, and we think you're going to like what we see. In this case now, this is in Washington State, we have some mountains. 
One of the mountains is Mount Rainier. As you can see by this callout on the sectional map, that point is 14,410 feet tall. When I use the terrain x-ray feature in FlyQ, I see 14,409. We're off by one foot. Not bad, huh? Pilot's Guide. In learning any product, having some printed documentation to go by is great. Previously, we had something called the Getting Started Guide, which did cover a lot of ground and was a great way to get started. Pilots told us, though, they wanted something more detailed, and here we delivered. The new Pilot's Guide is 84 pages of very detailed information, much more information than the old Getting Started Guide, in particular about flight planning, about settings, and so on, plus everything which is in the Getting Started Guide. This has page numbers, table of contents, easily printable, and so on. It's available in a couple of different places. One is available directly from within the product. If you go to the settings screen and you hit the link that says technical support, right over here, you come to a page which you may not have known about but should get to know, which is the technical support page. This lists all of the dozens of YouTube videos we have, uh, what's called the Getting Started Guide, the ADSB Primer, the FAQ, or you can send an email to support. Notice it doesn't actually say Pilot's Guide. We changed the name of it just before uh, we released the product and after the product was already finished. So the Getting Started Guide is now the Pilot's Guide. Sorry about that. You can also download this from our website. Simply go to seattleavionics.com, go to the Products page, click on FlyQ, and in the Documents section, the first item in the list is a Pilot's Guide. There are a lot of other great features in this release of the product too. Probably the single most requested feature actually is this one, that when the operating system on the iPad shuts down FlyQ for some reason because it wants to run some other program or whatever, now the last used flight plan is automatically reloaded. That saves you a ton of time uh, while you're flying. We added a new, and I think I showed this in the presentation a bit earlier, we added a new map button uh, on searches. When you hit the map button, it jumps the map immediately to that point. This saves you a tap. There, as I said, there's been a number of features added for ADS-B, and one of the things is the ability to filter out your own ship, that is yourself, uh, traffic as displayed on ADS-B traffic. Previously, especially if you had ADS-B out, you would see essentially a shadow of yourself on the ADS-B traffic display as a red icon. That can be a little bit disquieting to see something that looks like it's about to hit you. So now you can type in your tail number and it won't be displayed on the ADS-B traffic. Similarly, many of the ADS-B systems that we support, the Clarity, for example, the Sky Radar systems, the Eye Level systems, and the Stratus 2, all have what's called an AHARS, which is to say, a solid state reference system that tells you yaw, pitch, and roll. Sometimes they get a little bit out of sync, so we now have a single tap reset um, available for all the different AHARS devices. We like simplicity, and we think that the settings page was a little bit cluttered, so we went back and we cleaned up the way that we do settings. It's more organized, easier to understand. A lot of pilots, especially helicopter pilots, told us that having hazards layer that embedded both obstacles and the train avoidance, or TAWS, was a little bit cumbersome. They wanted the ability to see obstacles without seeing the train because, well, they knew that they were always flying within a thousand feet of the train. So now we split them into two different layers. The hazards layer is gone, the TAWS layer and the obstacle layer uh, replace it. Speaking of TAWS, we also added in the ability to simply hide the TAWS when you're on the ground, that is during pre-flight planning. In other words, in previous releases of the product, if you're doing pre-flight planning and the hazards layer was on, you may see everything red. You won't see that again. Um, you can configure this in a, set in a switch in settings, by the way. We also want to make the satellite cloud layer refresh more frequently. In the previous version of the product, we used a data product from a third-party provider that was updated once every two hours. We've now moved to a different data product that's updated every 30 minutes. Similarly, previously the radar images that we displayed had a lot of blue on them that people asked us what the blue meant. Well, the blue simply meant cold air, but that was very confusing to people. So we've now filtered out the vast majority of that blue from the radar display. There's a lot more added to. This is only scratching the surface. What I'd recommend you do is to take a look at the new pilot's guide, which goes into great detail about all of these features. For everyone at Seattle Avionics, I'm Steve Padracic, and this has been What's New in FlyQ version 1.5.